Welcome to Managing Uncertainty, a podcast series from the experts at Bright Path discussing global risk, business continuity, and crisis management. Will you be ready to lead your organization through its critical moment? The boom is over. The event the, happened. The event happened. I mean, we had this bad thing, whatever it was. We activated our crisis process. We responded. A crisis team came together and and interacted and collaborated and schemed and worked through a difficult situation. And outside parties came in. Outside parties Law were involved. Law enforcement maybe was involved. And now it's over. And we've started the process of recovery, which can take years. What do we do? I mean, and now what happens? Now what happens? How do we learn? How do we know things worked or yeah. didn't work? So I think the first step in this process would be to have an immediate hot wash. Well, so we're talking about after action processes. After right? action. So we start with a hot wash. What 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 the heck is a hot wash? Because so, I know the first time I heard this, I was like, well, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is a foreign language. Yeah. And this is something, to be honest, I feel like we do fairly well in the military because we do, I mean, I learned this from a very young age, that after a big incident, after something occurred, you do some kind of an after action. Sometimes it's involved, sometimes it's not as involved, but usually we start with a hot wash. Right. So an immediate discussion of oh, what just happened and what went right and what went wrong. And sometimes there's emotions involved in that discussion as well. Because it, it just happened. And particularly if it was a violent event or it was a traumatic event, there's a lot of emotion involved. And I, and I think particularly for me, my as we've talked before, like my emotional an adrenaline dump happened when the disaster was over. Like when I knew that people were safe was the hardest time for me. And I think everybody's going to be different with this, but I think most people that do crisis things for a living, that emotional release comes when the incident's over. And yep. so the hot wash was always kind of a difficult time for me. I had to really kind of collect myself and then kind of focus into this discussion that we were going to have. It and depended think, on the incident, of course. I think we've seen over time that that's, that's the fact for a lot of people. A lot of people kind of go through that. Now their emotions are at an all-time high during the hot wash. Right. And sometimes finger, fingers get pointed and it's not helpful, but sometimes really we try to, And we try to keep that out of the... Try to, right. yeah. So a hot wash is really a, a more of an informal, immediate after-action discussion about what just happened. Um, are we clear on the facts of what just happened? And you get into the conversation of kind of evaluating the response from your team. And it's not about individuals. It's about what worked, what didn't work. Did we do what we were supposed to do? Did we follow our processes? Or were those processes not adequate and we threw them aside along the way, which happens right. sometimes. But it's really that question of in the hot wash, okay, what worked that we just saw? And what didn't work? Yeah, and then in that initial conversation, who should lead that, and how long should that last? Right. Well, I think you know, I think about the, I think the most difficult hot wash situation that you and I were involved in when we worked together in a corporate setting. In a corporate setting, was we had an active shooter uh, incident at a headquarters location. This was literally across the street, um, and we've talked about this incident on a previous episode of the podcast. But we did a hot wash with the incident commander from the the law enforcement agency that led the response, his staff, several of our leaders, and the entire SWAT, two SWAT teams actually, that very responded. Very crowded discussion. It was a very crowded discussion, and we were fortunate to have a room that could accommodate everybody. But it was a, it was a pretty, it was a 30-ish minute, 45-minute discussion that in retrospect, I think we said probably wasn't really well led because we thought the police were going to drive it and the police actually had no idea how they were going to drive this particular conversation. <laughs> so we took over yeah. as it went on. But that said, there were some valuable lessons that we captured from that conversation. But we also realized that in a hot wash, you're not going to get you're, – you're looking for the immediate info of what worked and didn't. You don't get the reflective – Hey, I've had some time to think about this, and Hindsight. now I yeah. think this, and I think this, and I think this. Right. 
Yeah. Or high, or the hindsight of, oh, I can see why they were reacting that way because big picture, this is what they were dealing with, but we were over here dealing with this and we weren't coming together. Right. So those types of um, things can come out in a after action, a more organized mm -hmm. one, a short period of time after the hot wash, but right. enough time for people to get some rest and to think about what think just happened. And, and converse and process. Yes. And come down on. from that high, that sort of fight or flight high that they were just on. Mm -hmm. So we always encourage the hot wash immediately at the end of the response, but brief, 30 to 45 minutes. It does need to be strongly led. We prefer to lead these as someone in, you know, a leader within your crisis organization or from the leader that you're or a leader from the organization that your crisis team reports into. Or, you know, if available. Or, if available. Yeah. But. The incident lead, it's probably a good option. Right. But it's a, it's kind of a conversation with the team and perhaps other leaders that were involved in that response or recovery about what worked and what didn't. And you need to have a scribe. You need to take those notes. And that's kind of that's kind of the immediate the immediate after action is that hot wash. Yeah, it's like an immediate discussion. brain dump. Right. Know? And then a pause. How Three long? Three days, five days, a week, ten days. I think you kind of have to judge based on what what went on and when is the right time to to have this discussion. Right, because you might be having people requiring to take some time off in between the discussion. Right. You don't want it to be so long that people are forgetting. Right. Um, but it's a good idea if you're involved in a crisis to take some notes throughout that time. So that break time between the incident and the after action, the formal after actions, to start taking some notes and jotting down some things so you can remember that during the discussion. One thing that I learned when I went through the NPLI program at Harvard was the value in journaling during an event because, and we had to, we, we had a requirement to journal daily during the program. But something that I got immense value out of was hearing these guys who have made their life's work talking about the decisions that are made in national scale emergencies, who would go to the command centers of like the Deepwater Horizon um, incident and sit there with the incident commander and watch a meeting or a conference call or a video conference. And then in the lull that followed to say, why did you just make that decision? What drove you to do that versus the other four options that you were given? Why did you decide to pick that person to lead this effort? Why did you make, why did you say this instead of perhaps these other things that you could have said, but it's the immediacy of that information that you don't remember later, but you remember it in the moment because you just made it. Right. So these formal after actions, let's talk about that for a second, okay? So this formal after action, who should lead it, what should we talk about, who should be involved, those types of questions seem to always come up. And, and, and it's a little bit more formal, right? So there's some time to set a calendar invite to, to get people to start thinking about what they want to say. So usually start. I usually start when I'm doing an after action is what went well. So I like to start with the positive note. So what, mm -hmm. what went well in the situation? What, what worked? What worked? What do we want to keep for the next time? Mm -hmm. And then once we get through that process, usually people are a little bit on a, on a high of all the good things that they did. Then it's sort of weem into the, okay, so now what, what can we do better? Mm -hmm. How can we fix this for next time? And again, th these conversations are not about blame. It's about not at all. How do we be better? But I think it's natural to feel you know, maybe a sense of being attacked or something like mm -hmm. that, but it's, it's not the intent at all. And it shouldn't be used against people either. No, 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 no. <laughs> not at all. It's, this is not a, this is not a performance review or no. audit. It's how do we be better yeah. at the things that we're trying to accomplish here as a team? You right. know, how do we, how do we grow from this and how do we fix some of the things? What are the shortcomings that we didn't see before mm -hmm. that we now see because we experienced it Right. and how do we fix those? We often encourage after actions to happen in some in some groups, like minded, not like minded, like rolled groups might be the best way to explain it. But I always encouraged. Um, we always did them as the crisis team together, without other leaders or stakeholders or impacted locations. But we did just the crisis team because that was a team that had been through many things together and were very candid with each other. Very. <laughs> very candid with each other. But that's what you want. Yeah. And so we would do a, a, an after-action meeting with that group. We did one with just our internal team that worked on crisis stuff full-time. 
And that was often about our internal processes for supporting a crisis. But it was also about the incident leader asking for feedback Mm -hmm. in a non-blameful way. Constructive. But how do I be better at what I just did? Like, where did I do well and what did I not do well from a leadership standpoint? I need to do better. And I always thought those were really healthy conversations. But they were held in a safe environment. Absolutely. And then we would do a call with the impacted uh, leaders from the locations in that particular case that were involved in this crisis um, and were able to, you know, glean, like, how could we better support you? Do you have adequate training for the roles that we expect you to have in a crisis? So all of this kind of flows into an after action report, but they're separate conversations. Right. And in a large scale incident, we often did like the active shooter incident we've referenced before. I think we did some focus group conversations with impacted uh, team members, employees. We met with some leaders who had people in that building based on what they had heard. So we did a lot of things a little differently to capture as much feedback as possible, but to also to make sure that people felt that their input was included right. in this uh, very serious situation. And that's because we worked for a large scale organization right. where there was a lot of players, but a smaller organization, same concept, mm-hmm. maybe would be a few less conversations. Right. Um, you probably wouldn't need to have as many, but same, same thing you're capturing. You have to adjust that for the size of organization that you're running. Right. So at the end of this, you're writing a report of some type, a, a brief report we always try to get to. But uh, we encourage and we coach our clients on in a simple summary of the incident, like what are the facts of what happened, the timeline that went with that. And then here are the things that worked. Here's what went well. Right. Um, here's what we saw as opportunities, things that didn't go well. Here's what we're going to do about it. Like Here's the actions that we've agreed to take. Uh, as a part of this after action. And those actions should be specific, actionable to a person or a team. Um, They should have a date associated with when they're expected to be done in a priority. Like, are they high? Is it medium? Is it low? Yeah. I think there's also value to sharing that information. Yes. So especially in an instant like we're talking about where there are a lot of people involved, not just in the incident, but we're just involved because their friends were over there or maybe they were in one of those rooms and they want to know what the company is going to do about it because they were happy, unhappy about certain things. So getting their input is also valuable. And then right. to let them know, hey, we're this isn't just going to sleep. We have all of these processes we're improving. Mm-hmm. And then I think, yeah, I mean, I think you bring up a great point about there should be a way to, to share this information with stakeholders, with impacted locations and there has to be some overall accountability and tracking of the action items. Yeah. So if you have a crisis team, that's probably the place that that should be owned. But if you don't, and many of you that listen to the our podcast, we know don't really have teams, somebody needs to own that follow-up process. Yeah, it just makes everyone feel better when they know that the place that they're working or going to school or the hospital that they're in, they they know that that they're working towards better things. Right. I think that's a good thing. So I have a question. After you do the working group and all of this, and all of this sounds like really good stuff, right? So why isn't there one done? Sometimes, why why wouldn't you do an after action report? I, I, I don't understand why you wouldn't do that. And I know there's a lot of times when things don't don't get done, and for a lot of reasons. So, for instance, no one maybe wants to initiate the discussion. Right. You know, maybe, and it can be a hard discussion to initiate. Uh, super hard, right? right? Well, you're questioning how I performed. Yeah. Even though I'm not. No. That's not the intent. But some people will take it that way. Yep. And some people will mean it that way, but that shouldn't be the case at all. So that's hard to point out your mistakes and other people's mistakes. So that's one reason that maybe they don't get done. Um, so you just kind of power through that. You got to work through that and put your emotions on the table and just say, okay, let's put this aside and let's have these discussions. Another reason I know that maybe this doesn't get done is there isn't someone that's assigned to initiate that conversation. So I think before an incident happens, it's a good idea to have somebody, whether like we talked about, is the incident lead that their responsibility is to hold this after action mm-hmm. so that it actually gets accomplished. I, I, and I think... In a lot of cases, this doesn't happen out of, it's not because of malice that after actions don't occur, it's that we just get busy. Yeah. Right. We've had the events and now we're post response and we're in recovery and we're thinking ahead to what's next. And we probably don't do this full time. 
and we're already thinking about, I got to go back to my regular job and do this other stuff. And yeah, but you need to also talk about what you will never get better. No. If you don't engage in this, in, a, in some type of after action process with some accountability. And sometimes there's the op, the idea that you just want to move on. Just, right. Let's just put that, let's just put that behind us. Let's just move on. Let's just move on. What was it? Who was it that said that uh, if we don't learn from history, then we're, doomed to repeat the mistakes of the past. We may as well lie down on the railroad tracks so the train of history can run over us. Right. And everyone's been in an organization that just repeats the same mistakes. So the after action is a way to correct that. It's a way to make sure you only create, you only commit original <laughs> new mistakes, yeah. which yeah. are better. Yeah, better new, better new <laughs> mistakes that you're making because we all make them. <laughs> there's, there's always getting better. <laughs> I think that's always a, yeah, I mean, I was trying to think about the the other discussions that I've had in my career around this. And they think that particularly if you have a well-oiled crisis process, the after action stuff can seem like kind of a drag because, you know, I remember coming out of Hurricane Sandy where we had performed at our old employer really, really well. And, you know, the CEO was thrilled and the board was thrilled and local communities were thrilled and we had really come off of pretty phenomenal management of the situation. And then we had to sit there and go, yeah, but God, there's like 40 things that didn't go great. <laughs> and I was going to say, and I venture to guess that during and after action, yeah, still I mean, we had a whole things. list of stuff, yeah. uh, good and bad and ugly that we're like this, we've got to figure these things out so that we can be better. You know, and I'm not sure how we could have been better, but <laughs> Except there was for a those list 40 of things. things. Yeah. There was a list of things we thought we could do better, but our results. We needed to order the pizza earlier. <laughs> <laughs> we needed to order the pizza earlier. No, there were so many problems. <laughs> so many problems. And, and you know, and I think that's worth bringing up that, I mean, I think a good crisis team is going to identify lots of opportunity for improvement. There's also opportunities to, for improvement that are big right. and that take time to resolve. I know one of the issues. I recall coming out of Hurricane Sandy is we thought that we had licked this. How do we get access to a site? How do we get credentialed to gain access to get our people in and get our equipment in in order to recover a location that was critical infrastructure? And that worked, except in one state. And in that one state, the state was like, well, yes, you can get in and you can. So we here we go. Convoy of trucks and stuff going in. And then you get township officials going, no, we're not open for business here. You're like, wait, but the state but told us. State, okay, yeah. so we have to, we had to find a way to fix that. That took forever to figure out. And it, you know, it, it, you had to move some political mountains to yeah. make that happen. Yeah, I also think too. You know, from the outside looking in, it may seem that everything went really well, mm-hmm. and everyone's giving you kudos and the slap on the back and all this. You know, you're doing really good things, and like you said, we did all these great things during Hurricane Sandy. But you internally, your team internally knows that there are things that that need that right. could be made better. Yeah, and I think this is I, to me. I think that that's just part of being a good crisis leader yeah. is. You know, the ability to see that there's things that you can always be better. You're always kind of enhancing those and figuring out how to prioritize that through a yep. good process. And I think it should be implemented into your process. Right. So you go through the crisis. After action is documented right in there as the next step. Right. So have an after action process uh, and, and, and have those difficult conversations about how to do better. Be transparent and share the information and you'll be better for it over time. And okay. so will your response. Definitely. Thanks for listening to this episode of Managing Uncertainty, produced by the experts at BrightPath. To receive notifications of new episodes, join our newsletter at brightpath.com or subscribe to your favorite podcast player, such as iTunes or Google Play. Learn more about the services and trusted advice from BrightPath by visiting brightpath.com. That's B-R-Y-G-H-T-P-A-T-H dot com.